All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. For those who have tuned in already, we're spending the whole day behind the scenes at National Geographic, so shedding some light on the people who do the behind the scenes work that makes some of the really cool things that photographers and explorers do possible. So if you join us already, we've been beekeeping. We've um, been with Alex looking at maps. We just got out of the engineer lab looking at critter camps with Tyler. And now you might be able to hear the sound around here. We are in the photo archives at National Geographic. So we're down in the basement and we're with Sarah Manco. And, hi, Sarah. <laughs> and Sarah um, was born in Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. She, at 14, started using her father's camera and taking pictures. And I think that kind of instilled a little passion for photography in you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You studied uh, journalism with a kind of a focus on photography. Yes, yeah. I wanted to be a photojournalist for a long time. Yeah. Then I went to grad school and found photo preservation instead. So yeah. then it, now I'm here. And then you worked at the African American Museum, I believe. Yeah, the African American, uh, sorry, not that. The um, African Art Museum. Okay, perfect. Not, not the new one. Okay, okay. Yeah. Awesome. And so what led you here to National Geographic? Uh, I just always wanted to work here because I studied photography and this was to me was the pinnacle of, of photo history and photography and all the amazing photojournalists around the world and all of their work was always published in National Geographic. So this was always a, a dream job for me. Yeah. So where we're standing right now is obviously climate control. Yes. Yeah, yeah you can kind of, these kind of loud in this room and you can hear our, our climate system. It's totally different from the rest of the building. So it's 65 degrees in here all the time and 40% humidity. That keeps the photos really happy because light and, and heat are really bad for photographs. Right. And you, you, you told me earlier that there's about 8 million photos archived down here of 12 yep. million photos. Yeah, we have around 12 million in the collection roughly and 8 million are in this room. We have a couple other rooms that are even colder. So we're the really, really proud of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then, so what we're going to do today is we're going to look back in time and we're going to check out some of the photos that have been published, uh, some that haven't been published, and just take a look at what, how things have progressed over the years and end off with the digital. So we'll talk to you a little bit about that more towards the end. Yeah. All right. Cool. And so being down here in the photo archives, you must come across cool things all the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah. Lots of really, really fun stuff down here, yeah. And I know someone asked me the other day, so there's 8 million photos down here. What percentage do you think that you seen yourself or dealt with? Probably less than 10%. Yeah. I've only had this job for a year, yeah. so I'm still learning everything. But there's just so much, and there's just a lot of images to look at. 10% is still pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty impressive. It's all I do every day is look at photos. <laughs> all right. Well, I know you have something ready for Thank us you. right away. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? I'll get the camera ready. So I have here, um, it's part of the oldest part of the collection. And it's a photo album from Japan. And this couple decided they wanted to go on a four-year honeymoon around the world. So they decided to go to Europe and Asia, and they spent a lot of time in Java and Burma. And so they came back with this photo album. And so these, this is one of the oldest um, photo, photographic processes, so albumin prints. So uh, it's one of the oldest ways that people can make images. Now, these are from the 1870s. So that predates the National Geographic. It predates National Geographic, yeah. So this, uh, their, the couple's son was cleaning out their basement and said, hey, do you want their, my parents' photo albums? And so we took them. Uh, so it's a really unique, really, really cool historic glimpse into Japan. I love the colored ones, too. They hand, someone hand-tinted that. So they took a black and white image and colored them in. I'm going to try and get a little closer because yeah. there's the color there, but it's just slightly off, but it's still a really cool, um, really cool technique of bringing a little color to the pictures with that hand tinting. And not, the Japanese were masters of the hand tinting. Yep. They did it the best out of anybody. So this is probably one of the few things in here that isn't, say, National Geographic. Yes, it's probably everything else in this archive basically relates to expeditions or magazine articles that we, that we did. Yep. This is probably the only thing that doesn't directly relate to something that we funded over the years. Yep. So, and a lot of the captions are in French yep. because the wife was French and was fluent. That was her first language, so she captioned everything in, in French. So I would love to get those translated and transcribed someday. 
Yeah. Oh, these are amazing photos. All right. So there we go. It's something predating 1888 when the society was founded. So I'm excited for this. We were um, with Alex Tate, the geographer at National Geographic, yes, earlier yeah. this morning, and he showed us uh, some maps that Bingham used uh, had drawn up when he was in Peru. So. What do we have yeah, here? Well, we have here, I have a photo album from Hiram Bingham's like, the Peruvian Expeditions. So you kind of, kind of already know that this is when he went to Machu Picchu and he uncovered it. So uh, he was in Peru looking for the lost city of the Incas and he actually found a few different sites that were lost to archaeological history while he was there and one of them is Machu Picchu. And so he was out looking for different areas, asked the locals, the local said, oh yeah, there's this old city up on this mountain. You want to come climb it with me? So he did, and he found Machu Picchu. Um, so he was instrumental in uncovering it and bringing it to light to the rest of the world. Um, so these are some photographs of when he have how he found it all overgrown. And, uh, but I also love his these albums because he was so detailed in his captions. Yeah. So you can, you know, it says at the time of day here underneath. It says, you know, November 11th, 1912 at 8 a.m. He took this picture, this, this photograph of this round tower using a flash showing the entrance. You know, it's so, he's so precise because he's a scientist. Yeah. So uh, we have about 12,000 photographs from him yeah. and uh, around 18 photo albums. So when he came back from his, his trip, he made these prints and put them in these albums and took up these captions and then gave them to National Geographic this way. So if any classrooms aren't familiar with the site in Peru, uh, Machu Picchu, it is one of the most incredible uh, ruins. And so this this was before it was cleaned up. This was, he was one of the first kind of outside of maybe more local people to see and document and uh, find this yeah. The city. Yeah, he was one of the first outsiders. Peruvians knew about the city, yeah. but he was one of the first Westerners to, to know about it and to bring it to the rest of the world. I think what's so, so cool about this is we don't, I mean, when I grew up, we still made photo albums. Yeah. We still had film yeah. that we developed, but now everything's digital, and you can you can put these things up instantly. Right. So you'd have to take all these pictures and send them to get developed, and then put together in a photo album like this. So a lot more. It was a lot more labor intensive. intensive. Yeah. And he used glass plate negatives yeah. when he was out in the field. So he had cameras on tripods with glass plates, and he would schlep with him up a mountain, hope that they didn't break. Yeah. Take photographs of them, hope he exposed it right, bring it back to the US somehow, and then develop them later. So it was a, a much bigger, um, much bigger ordeal photograph. He was very particular. He trained all of his team members to, to use cameras because he knew he wanted yeah. to document everything. Was doing. So. Neat to see these photos kind of looking so raw before things were cleaned up and made more touristy. Yeah. And it's just, it's just sitting there. Local people knew about it, and they're like, oh yeah, there's this city up there. And now it's a huge attraction. People yeah. journey thousands of uh, miles, and probably hundreds of thousands of people a year come to, to see this spot. And so the locals yeah. are like, yeah, it's that old city on the hilltop. And I get it right. Oh yeah, that place. <laughs> so it's cool that you guys got to see the the maps today too, because that also there's so much to this place, we have a film collection that's just as big as the photo collection. Yeah. We have a documents collection that's also huge. So there's a lot of rich history here. And it's divided up into a lot of different ways. All right. All what else can yeah. you show us, Sarah? Um, how about the first wildlife photos at night? That sounds pretty cool. So when are these dated from? So these were published in 1906. And I think they were photographed maybe the year before. And this guy named George Shiras from the Midwest, yay. Huh. Um, and he um, photographed all these in Michigan. He floated around a boat and just had this big old magnesium powder flash that he would use. Yeah. And he would just flash all these animals. And there are some with albino deer, there are porcupines, there are, it's a lot of standard animals that we're more familiar with, nothing too exotic, but still really, um, really cool to see. And the first time anyone else had ever thought about photographing wildlife in that way. Yeah. And it's neat because, again, we take for granted that our phones have night settings. Yeah. 
and amplify the light for us. And he had to create his own flash system out of before. And this is before you had flash bulbs too. So he yeah. used powder that he blew up, and that created a big flash of light, and that was what created a camera flash before you had light bulbs. And I'm sure if you could see the second frame, the deer would be like bugging what out of there pretty yeah. fast, <laughs> yeah. running away. So these That's are cool. pretty. These are pretty great. Um, this is a fun one. This is all mine here. Oh yeah. The other thing I love about these is they have the the prop marks on them too. So, so these were published in a book. These yeah. photographs were. Um, on it, it's his book. That's all. It's called Hunting for Wildlife at Night with a Flash in the Camera. Yeah. And so the, these images all have these marks on them that are the prop marks. So uh, the editors went in and said, I want to use this photograph, but I want you to make it just a little bit shorter, a little bit skinnier, do all this stuff to it. See that here. And then on the back, we have captions and information on how it was published, and a little caption that Shira's wrote for us. When we received the image, when it was, when it was indexed, so when it was cataloged in our system here, uh, yeah, where it was published, well, yeah. yeah, the paper, the title and page number. Everything's pretty yeah. meticulous here. Very meticulous. And if it's not, then it gets lost. Yeah. <laughs> you have to keep track of a lot of things here. Awesome. Yeah. So those are, those are pretty cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, should we jump forward in time? Let's go. Should we go to Apollo? Take us to another time. OK, we're going to go to Apollo. We're going to go to space. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, back during in the 1960s, yep. we, there was the space race. And we actually had a very good relationship with NASA. And our space editor maintained that relationship for the years. And our photographers ran the photo lab in and down where all the computers and where everything was launched from. And so from that relationship, we ended up with a big collection of photographs. And it's a copy of what NASA has in their archive. Yeah. So we have Armstrong. Yeah. And then we also have photographs from them when they actually were on the moon with Paul and other. And not a lot of archives have a copy photos, of yeah. what NASA has, which is uh, I didn't even know we had this collection here until I got this job, but I wandered up and down the aisles. I saw this big section that said space collection on it. And it's all the Gemini missions, all of the Apollo missions, and all of Skylab, which I think predates NASA. It's like the precursor to yep. NASA. Yep. Um, so, the moon. Which the moon, guys? <laughs> Casual. Um, and then these, these photos are cool because they also have information on the backs of them as well. Yep. And they, it's uh, stamped with the NASA stamps, National Air, Aeronautics and Space Administration from July to August 1969, and it'll caption that NASA wrote for us. Do you, do, you, do you know when these uh, came to the archive? It would have been around that time. Right around that time. Yeah, because the, look, look at this paper, it's, it must have been right when they, yeah. they were printing all of these and making all of this. Oh, a view so. of the moon right from the lander. Oh, these are amazing photos. And then there's this one that's the TV screen yeah. <laughs> when it was broadcast. Um, and then these are cool. There's the launch, the launch here, and people watching the launch. So these guys are this little capsule up here. Yeah. That this giant rocket ship exploding behind them. Can't imagine what it would have been like to. Uh, Strapped on top of that much rocket right. We also have a lot of training images. Yep. Uh, and photographs of them doing learning how to fly and learning what zero gravity is going to feel like. Trying you know, to put the spacesuits on. Yeah. And, uh, here's a picture of Earth. Pretty important yeah. looking back. No, these are amazing, and the fact that you could really only probably find them here or in the NASA archives. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and then they, they got quarantined and they came back to, to Earth. Yeah. So this is their, that's their wives <laughs> looking in on them, and, mm -hmm. and this is the scientists working with them and asking how they're doing and checking out their, their, their biometrics and everything. Yeah. And then this was actually, I read the, cap, the back of this photo here, and he's showing the moon dust on his hand because they opened up some of their film canisters from the cameras and the dust came out of it and he's showing how he has the dust on his hand. That's but awesome. it's okay because they were still in quarantine. 
yeah. nothing was going to happen. Because just in case there was yeah. something on the moon. Yeah. All right, well, those are amazing. I uh, Things like that in such big events, and that's probably just all throughout these aisles here. You can probably yeah. find all um, kinds of amazing. Build up an aisle here for you guys. All electronic. Most, most um, archives have a game I have the aisle. Electronic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this, this aisle here is uh, one of our unpublished aisles. Yeah. It's all black and white photographs that have not been published. So this is all this, a gold mine waiting to be, it's going to be looked at. Absolutely amazing. It's organized geographically, because we're National Geographic, and that's how we operate. <laughs> that makes sense, yeah. Um, so, and then, and then after that, by photographer. So it's really easy to find locations, you know, photographs by certain photographers. Yeah, certain situations. Yeah. See, there's quite a few stacks, and that's how you get over 8 million photos. Yep. <laughs> like this. It's tall, too. Gotta put them together. I have ladders to go reach up. You can see these are like 20 feet tall in here. Yeah. Um, That's what we go through. Wow. It's a stretch here. So I think there's a lot. It's a bigger volume here than some of the aisles. All right, very cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we got to show the aisles moving because I think that's going to be a feature to show. They're on motion sensors, so you can't get squished. That's important. I'm sure that question would have come up, so I'm glad you yeah. covered it. Yep, and it's, um, I, it's really sensitive too, so it keeps a piece of tape to fall in just the right spot, and it will detect on the sensor, and then yep. the tape will and cool. go up the top. Awesome. So you pulled out today a couple illustrations. Yeah. So let's take a look at some of these. So um, in addition to photographs, we also have a lot of artwork. Because anything a photo couldn't do, we commissioned artists to illustrate for us. So this is one of my favorites. This is from the 1930s. And this was by Elsie Bosselman. And she was an artist on an expedition where this, this, um, this biologist went in the bathysphere, this big circular orb thing, descended down to the depths of the ocean, and he radioed back up to the surface what he was looking at. And Elsie Bosselman was on the surface on the boat, and so she drew everything that he described to her. This was before they could take cameras that deep and expose the flash or use light to take images underwater. So this is what, what the, their impression of what underwater life was like in the 1930s. So wow. If someone was dictating things to me, it would look like goldfish crackers. It would not look <laughs> that nice right. at all. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, there are these pictures of her with this little radio headset on on this, on this boat, and she's drawing. And so these are uh, pastels on paper. She's coloring everything. So, yeah. That's amazing. Really cool. So uh, we have like about 70 works by her. Yeah. So quite a lot. She did a lot of illustrations for us over the years. So a lot of them. She's also known for these, these black ones for the, the deep sea creatures. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Now they do have photos. I mean, they're bang on. That's yeah. So yeah. Cool. Now that we know what it looks like. Yeah. And it's just interesting to, to think how they did that back then. How did you get an illustration of something? really see or you can get a photograph of it. Yeah. So. Awesome. Yeah. And then I have to ask about this one. I mean, that guy, I don't know much about that guy. All I know he's a pirate and it was published in the book called Treasures of the Sea. He's not. <laughs> That's what says on the back. So I did the use, you know, and this, a lot of historic battles too. Yeah. So sort of all the lines of what a photograph could do, they, you know, a lot of science images and a lot of historic battle scenes or historic anything, historic epic things that we can't go back in time and photograph, so an artist needs to do for us. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm surprised they couldn't find a picture of a pirate with his hair on fire, but... <laughs> I know, I know. Somebody, some pirate maniac yeah. would have done that somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So yeah, when you can't get the photo, illustration's the next best thing. Yeah, right. All right. So I think we're moving so, over to the light table yeah, now. Yeah. All right. Sure. So this, I've definitely been looking forward to this part. So, so this first thing I have over here, um, so these are color slides. So this is color film. This is how National Geographic photographed over the years up until digital. So from about the 1930s all the way up until digital cameras came around, we had color film that shot, we shot most of our, 
or magazine assignments on. So this one I pulled for you guys to look at is Jacques Cousteau, who, this is the article, At Home in the Sea by Captain Jacques Cousteau. And uh, we have here, so here's an published image, and this is that image right here. And so I have in these cardboard uh, little frames are the images that were published in the magazine. And, and then these bigger square ones next to it are some of the unpublished ones. All right. Um, so basically, a photographer would go out into the field and would shoot hundreds of rolls of film, but only maybe 20 photos would get published. And per, per roll of film, there's about 36 frames. So 36 times 100, that's a lot of images. So we have a lot of, of unpublished film that goes with most of our magazine assignments. And those are also sitting down here in boxes waiting to be discovered. So um, I pulled a few of those for you guys to check out too. Amazing. And speaking for myself, I've been a diver for 10 years. And Dr. So his adventures growing up had a huge influence yeah. on my yeah. life. So it's neat to see the published ones here, but then there's so much unpublished material that people still have to yeah. dig through and discover. And who knows what treasures could be. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And with Jacques Cousteau, I think he got 32 grants from National Geographic, and a lot of those grants became magazines. Articles as well. Yep. So, 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 National Geographic not only is just the magazine, but also is a science grant giving entity. And so, we give a lot of grants to people who go out to the field, discover new species, or exploring a new place. So, a lot of firsts, like Hiram Bingham, was the grant. Um, Jacques Cousteau's Explorations of the Ocean were grants. So, a lot of first things that happened over the years yep. were grants that we funded. Yeah. Um, so, Jacques Cousteau got a lot of grants. I can imagine. And he got a lot of magazine assignments that came out of those grants. Um, so we have a lot of photographs of him. Which is yeah, cool. Amazing. He's a pioneer of scuba diving and underwater exploration. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you for sharing those with yeah. us. They're pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. All so right. one more thing to show you guys. Perfect. Um, and this is called an autochrome, which is a precursor to the, the color film that we have sitting next to it. Um, and this is the original one right here. And then the rest of these are copies that I have um, because they're really fragile, really light sensitive. But it's a glass plate that was coated with a black and white negative and three different layers of color. So it's kind of like RGB, same idea as pixels on your camera or on your phone and um, you know, additive color. Uh, and they took these glass plates into the field and took color photographs with them. And it was invented in the early 1900s by a couple of French brothers named the Lumiere brothers. Yeah. And they also were pioneers in, in making color, um, film, motion picture film. So we have the Lumiere thing for, for motion picture film as well. Um, and then our editors caught wind of these autochromes and said, wow, this is so cool. I want to show the world in color. Yeah. We should publish these. So we did. And we published autochrome and autochrome in 1914. And that was, we've been using color ever since. So, and then when film, was invented and Kodachrome was invented, then Autochrome was lost paper because who would carry glass with them when they could carry a little roll of film that's a lot exactly. lighter and it's not going to break. Yeah. So, but we have Autochromes from all over the world. Really cool. Amazing. Yeah. And now, now what are we doing? Where are the photographs going now? Are they still coming down here into the archives? Now they're on servers. We don't show you the server rooms. It's not as interesting. But, but the, now, now so much of this is digital now that it all goes to servers. Yeah. So this collection isn't growing necessarily. I bet the digital is getting huge because you can take so many pictures now and not have to worry about yeah. space and film and such. Yeah, it's a big volume and everyone's like, oh, it's a cloud, it's fine, but the cloud has to live somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, Sarah, thank you so much. I mean, My pleasure. We, we barely scratched the surface of, yeah. of what's down here, but it's absolutely incredible. Um, I think now, though, we should meet some of our classrooms. Yeah. And we'll take some Q&A. So I'm just going to yeah, readjust sure. the camera. Let's turn the lights back on. Yeah, that would be awesome. We'll bring the camera back up. All right. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to leave you here okay. in control, and I'm going to navigate the control. So let's meet our, our classrooms. So our first group is it's some repeat business. They joined us cool. this morning for our geography hangout. Awesome. So 
is in Virginia Beach. They're grade nine to through twelve students. Uh, yeah. have some questions. Hey guys. Hello. 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 Wait, who's doing it first? Who's asking you first? Do we have any questions? <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, I'll go. When photographers are taking pictures for the magazine, are they assigned what to capture, or do you guys like do it yourself and then turn them in? That's a great question. Um, a lot of photographers now actually help, they pitch their own stories. So a lot of them go, um, have already started working on a story, and they will go to the editor and say, hey, I want to work on this, this story. <clears throat> um, they, there's a lot of freedom being a photographer here. Uh, they kind of go out and they shoot whatever they feel like shooting, and we'll come back and the editor will help them craft that story together. Um, there is one story of one photographer, I think it was Wolfmar Wenzel, I think, uh, and in the 1930s, he was sent out to do India. And that was all he was told by the editor. To go do India, here's some film, and he was gone for like four months and traveled around India and shot a bunch of videos of India. That was his assignment. So he had a lot of green. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, go ahead if you guys have another question. Um, how do you decide what photos go in the articles? So which photos do uh, how do you decide what photos go into the articles? That's a great question for a photo editor. I think you guys have a, a, a Return That's right. There, Perfect but, time yeah. for a yeah. little pitch. At 1 p.m. Eastern, we will be with uh, Sadie Courier, and she's going to show us a story where the raw photos come in, and then they have to craft the story and the narrative that goes in the magazine. So we'll be covering that in about 32 minutes. Yeah. I've never been an editor, so I don't know all their process. Um, so I don't want to answer for them and not use that information. Um, but I just take care of the old photos. <laughs> all right. Let's jump to our next classroom joining us. We have Mrs. Van Oyen's group. They're joining us from uh, Kelowna, British Columbia, so from Canada. All right. Uh, your microphone's on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so what college did you go to? Uh, I did my undergraduate degree at Kansas State University. I majored in journalism there. And then I went straight on to grad school at, in Toronto, actually, in Canada. Yay. <laughs> uh, and I went to Ryerson, and they had a photographic preservation program. That nice. That's why they're how to preserve all the historic artifacts. All right. Yep. Great question. Do you guys have another one? No, I don't think so. Okay. Okay, we'll swing back towards the end in case something comes up. We're going to jump now to Mrs. Dunn's class. They are joining us. Hi, Mrs. Dunn's class. In at, from the Sioux County Schools in New England, Harrison, New England. Okay. Grade seven, eight class, your microphone is on. Oops, I lied, your microphone's not on yet. <laughs> it is now. All right, we are in Nebraska. Oh, sorry. Hi, Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. um, Hi. And we're having a Celebrate Geography Day, studying South America. Cool. Any Talked about Peru. <laughs> we have a band who is uh, uh, teaching about music from the Andes Mountains, and uh, the zoo is here and presenting about animals of South America. And then also there is a rainforest presentation. Well, I'm pretty excited you could be part of your day. It sounds Me like you've too. got a great one planned. I'm glad I showed the Hiram Bingham album. That was, that was good. <laughs> and I guess we do have one question. Yes. All right, come on up. What, um, pick, what camera would you recommend for taking, like, um, G any photograph, like, um, what camera would you recommend to first time user? First time photographers? Um, honestly, you can use your phone. A lot of people have really nice phones with really good cameras on them. Now. So, those are really good. Um, and anything more advanced than that, there is a Fuji film camera that's also really good. So, Fuji makes great cameras. All right, well, we'll come back to you guys in a moment. Yeah. We've got a question that's come in online. Cool. And they are from Hunt Middle School in Burlington, Vermont. And they're wondering what a typical day is like in the 
photo archives? Good question. Uh, it varies a lot from day to day, but a lot of this is research that I'm doing right now and for various projects. Yeah. So a lot of uh, um, people here want to, to publish images from the archive in books or in the magazine, and so then I'll go and try and help them find images. A couple months ago, we actually had a Rus an editor from the Russian edition of the magazine here. He spent a few days with me in the archive looking at photographs from the time of the Russian Revolution. Yeah, awesome. and then and he got a bunch of that stuff digitized, and he's taking the scans with him back to Russia to Russia, and he's going to publish a special edition there. So that's um, that's a big project, and and I also do a lot of of just like them, making sure that all the images are happy and in the right kind of containers or in the right boxes. So I've been putting things in, I've taken them out of these brown envelopes behind me and putting them into new boxes slowly. Um, and I do a lot of research for grantees as well. So a scientist will say, hey, I want to see your photographs of tree rings from back in the 1920s. And so right. then I go and see what we have from tree rings and help them with their research. So, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that some of these photos, there's a little bit of a time crunch to get them digitized. Some yep. of them are starting to, yes. to fade. Or... Some of them fade. Um, a lot of the color slides I showed you are in really good shape. A lot of them look magenta now. And that's the first sign of, of fading. And unfortunately, you can't do anything about that. It's just irreversible. And it happens, it happens to most photos. But all we can do is keep them in a, in a temperature controlled room and then scan them to be happily of what it looks like now. And then, then they'll do their thing. All right, yeah. well, let's meet our next classroom. They're with Mr. Londos, and I believe they're hanging out in the library. Cool. And they are uh, in Acton, Ontario, so it looks like a big group of students. And let's see if they have a question or two. So your microphone is on. I see them waving away. Hi. Yay. Listen. What do you want? <laughs> what do you want to do with all those? Yeah. Do you guys have a question? If, if you do, come right up nice and close because it's loud in the photo archive. Well, you want to know what are you going to do with all the pictures uh, when you're done? Or what, what's uh, what's the end game with all the photos? So it sounds, like, it sounds like the end game. Like, is this room going to be uh, around forever? Or Hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, hopefully we hope to get everything digitized eventually, which is a long time to do. Uh, but. But, digit, but that means we're still going to keep the originals. There's a lot of inherent characteristics to having this original photograph that we want to keep around. And uh, so it's really, really important to keep them as their own thing as well, not, not just if it's built out. So yeah, the room would stay, <laughs> and the temperature will stay the same. For as long as they'll, these photographs will hold Yeah, I mean, digital's pretty cool, but uh, being able to grab these photos. And, yeah. To be able to look at a photo like this and be able to see the markings, how it was used, and and then flip it over and see that there's writing on the back and that somebody handled this and wrote this and typed this, that's something that you don't get with digital. And sure, there might be some information typed in, but the, the having this physical handwriting just gives it another another life. So it's important to keep these originals too. So I just want to give a shout out to Mr. Blondeau's class. They were joining us from Winnipeg and they just dropped out about a minute ago. So I don't know if their internet went down. Hopefully they're able to get back in and get some questions from them. But uh, anybody who's watching online, there's the YouTube chat sidebar. So use the hashtag, ex or sorry, explore classroom on Twitter, but you can just put it in the YouTube chat sidebar. But let's go back to the classrooms. And anybody who still has a question, just come up right to the camera and wave. So I know to go to your classroom if you still have a question. Oh, okay. so we've got two more lined up. So let's first start back with Mr. Londo's group. Yeah. Microphone's on. Can I ask a question? Yeah, what's the purpose of the Rosetta Stone? What's your favorite part of your job? Favorite part of my job? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I actually really like it when I find something new that I didn't know was here. So it's, it's pretty easy to open up a box and not have any idea what's in it. Um, and a lot of times it's really, really cool stuff that I didn't know we even had here. So like the Perry, we have uh, Robert Perry, who was an old Arctic explorer. And we have photo albums of his that I knew we had. But I opened up one and it was all his sled dogs. And it was portraits of his sled dogs. I was like, it's like that's so fun and so cool. And I had no idea that we had these cool portraits of these huskies that he took with him on his trips. Yeah. So it's just fun to discover new things every day. 
and then interacting with people like Joe and people who have unique needs to use this collection, which is it's also really fun. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I can yeah. imagine pretty much every day you're able to pull out and see something new and, yeah. and pretty cool. Yeah. So I know our high school students in Virginia were waving like crazy. So, whoops, wrong microphone. Oh, she takes them. You've seen her? Yeah. What? Oh, is it us? Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, I was wondering yeah. what the most memorable picture you've ever seen was and why. Most memorable picture I've ever seen? Yeah. Why? Why? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, it's a hard question for someone who has to see so many. Can I show them to you guys? Yeah, why not? Okay. Why not? <laughs> okay, we're going to show kind of a really neat picture that we, that we haven't shown yet. And this is, uh, I think, an example of just some of the, you never know what you're going to come across. In the... Get a little bit ridiculous sometimes. Yeah. So we're going back into that original uh, Japan album. Um, yeah. This guy. So the last image in this album. Um, it actually parallels another image that I found that's really also really weird. All right. So this guy. Um, I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't know what's happening in the image exactly because it's all the captions all in French. But somebody lost his head, and I, I also like how they they. We're very careful to color in the blood stain on the ground as well. Just to make sure that we all saw it and we all knew what happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was, I flipped through this night, this album, and it's like, oh, these beautiful pictures of Japan. And then there's just someone who doesn't have a head anymore. Oh, that random so, artifact thrown in. Yeah. And there's um, another guy who's an explorer in China, and he has photographs of prisoners uh, that are in. Like locked up in these boxes, these wooden crates, and they're trying to escape, and it's really weird, and it's in like 1920, and it's really strange. So that's some of the strangest stuff I found is when explorers go out to these other cultures that no one else had explored, and they're they come back with these images of people in wooden crates, and that's their punishment for stealing something. A little bunch from China. So, yeah. Yeah. Some of the weirdest stuff. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's pop this back over here. I would say that's definitely a good example of a surprise picture to come across. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, feel Oh, I see someone waving from our class celebrating geography today, South American geography. We're ready. How long have you been a photographer? I, so I am more of an archivist than a photographer, uh, but I've been an archivist since about 2012 when I graduated from grad school. Before that, I was a photographer, and I worked in college as a photographer, and I did that for about six years. And then now I, I shoot my friends' engagements for fun, but I mostly most of my work is down here in this room, in this room here, not in the field as much. I teach, I teach photography too. All right, so we'll check in really quickly with Mrs. Van Oyen's class one more time. So you guys have another question for Sarah. If somebody was interested in getting into a career like yours, what should they do? That's a great question. Um, so I studied photojournalism in my undergrad, which is great for this place, this for National Geographic, because so much of this journalism. I have a lot of friends from my grad program that were fine art photographers or art history majors, and they just love art and love photography. And you just pursue that wildly, and then you get to these really cool places. Um, I did a lot of internships over the years too. Um, met a lot of people, worked in photo studios, I did internships in museums in my hometown, um, and just got in wherever I could and talked to people and yeah, lots of museums, a lot of archives, city archives, you know, would have to be able to take people in for internships. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and graduate's great. <laughs> I went to graduate school, but yeah. Cool. Well, boys and girls, thanks so much for joining us uh, from so many different locations and for the great questions. Um, Sarah, thank you so much My for pleasure. the time, and I've been using this as an excuse to get down here and pull from the photo <laughs> yeah. archives, so I'll have to, we'll have to schedule another one, so I have another excuse fun. to come back. <laughs> um, for those who are going to be tuning in later, uh, in about 20 minutes from now, uh, we'll be with uh, Sadie Courier and looking at um, 
photos. So we'll look at yeah. all the raw photos that come in for one story, how they narrow it down to maybe the 10 or 11 that actually make it into the magazine and how they build a story around it. So that's coming up next. That'll be fun. Again, thank you so much, Sarah. It was My a pleasure. lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to turn the microphones on so classrooms can just say goodbye and thank you, and then we'll sign out for today. Guys, your microphones are on. If you want to say goodbye and thank you. <laughs>